Well, as you heard in announcements, you know, we've got this uh, prophecy seminar coming up. Uh, Jesus on prophecy. We've got brochures that are going to be mailed out, and we're also going to have a stack that are brought here that we can wind up handing out personally. So we'll be able to give those to our friends and neighbors. Uh, people are brought to Christ. So this is a way that we can bring people to Christ. My talk this morning is on bridges. I know I don't usually read the name of the sermon in the, uh, in the bulletin, but in case anybody wondered what bridges are about, well, that's the Golden Gate Bridge. You're probably familiar with seeing that. This one is interesting. That's the London Bridge. It was built in 1830, and right now it is in Lake Havasu City, Arizona. And it was moved there in 1967. Some people don't have enough to do. <laughs> well, these are New Smyrna Beach bridges. Probably familiar with them. There's the North Bridge. We've seen that before. And then there's the South Bridge. Some of you may remember this bridge. White bridges. But these aren't the bridges we're talking about. I'm going to be talking about the cross bridge. This is the bridge that brings people from lost to saved. <coughs> Jesus gave the invitation to come over the bridge. My mind is busy all the time, and when I'm listening, I'm always what about this? What about that? How's this fit? How's that compared? So <clears throat> what I put together is through my experience and the things that I thought about while I was doing this. Jesus said that we had to be like little children. So if to come to Jesus is like a little child, how hard can it be? In John 3, uh, 3, 14 through 18, it tells us who will be saved. And, Mo and Moses lifted up the bronze snake on a pole in the wilderness, so that the Son of Man must be lifted up, so that anyone, everyone who believes in him will have eternal life. For this is how God loved the world. He gave his one and only Son, so that everyone who believes in him will not perish, but have everlasting life. God sent his son into the world, not to judge the world, but to save the world through him. There is no judgment against anyone who believes in him, but anyone who does not believe in him has already been judged for not believing in God's one and only son. So verse 15 says, everyone who believes in him will have eternal life. 16, <clears throat> anyone who believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. It doesn't sound too hard. In case we missed it, 18, no judgment against anyone who believes in him. So all we have to do is believe in Jesus. But there's got to be some change, you would think. If you believe in something that you don't know now, something's going to change. So what does the Lord require? In Micah 6, 6-8, it says, What can I bring to the Lord? Should I bring him burnt offerings? Should we bow before him? Should we bow before God, most high, with offerings of yearling calves? Should we offer him thousands of rams, 10,000 rivers of olive oil? Should we sacrifice our firstborn child to pay for our sins? Of course, the answer is no. It says, O oh people, the Lord has told us what is good and what is what. And this is what he requires of you. To do what is right, to love mercy, 
and to walk humbly with your God. Do what is right. Okay, we pretty much got that one down. We understand that. Love mercy. Sometimes that's a little harder. Walk humbly with your God. We read about Enoch. Enoch walked with God. And we know people that say that they walk with God. <clears throat> but do they really walk with God? Do we really need to know? Is it up to us? So when they use Jesus' name, what should we do? John said to Jesus, Teacher, we saw someone using your name to cast out demons. But we told him to stop because he wasn't in our group. Don't stop him, Jesus said. No one who performs a miracle in my name will soon be able to speak evil of me. Anyone who is not against us is for us. Jesus also said, one flock with one shepherd. I have other sheep too that are not of this sheepfold. I must bring them also. They will listen to my voice and there will be one flock with one shepherd. So when they listen to his voice, is some of that coming from us? We all know that angels are messengers. Aren't we to be messengers too? Jesus said, let me teach you. Okay, so if we're to be messengers, how do we do this? Jesus said, come unto me, all you who are weary and carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Let me teach you, because I am humble and gentle at heart, and you will find rest for your soul. For my yoke is easy to bear, and the burden I give you is light. How often do we make it so hard? We don't have to. So what have we learned from Jesus to help us build bridges to other believers? Well, I've got a list of things here. These are some doctrinal beliefs that we hold in common with, and this one is Baptist. I'm going to go through these, and let's just take a look at them. The Bible is the only rule of faith. Salvation by the grace, the Godhead, Jesus' second coming, baptism by immersion, so these are Baptists. Bible churches, non-denominational churches, strong emphasis on the Bible, salvation by grace, the Godhead, second coming, uh, Christ-centered preaching, Catholics, the Godhead, virgin birth of Jesus, uh, necessary to obey God, inspiration of the Bible, second coming, Church of Christ, inspiration of the Bible, uh, Christ is the only Savior for mankind. Second coming. <coughs> baptism by immersion. Episcopalians. The Godhead. Uh, God is love. The ultimate, ultimate triumph of truth. Alright. God answers prayers. Truths that we hold in common with Jews. Healthful living, understanding of death, the Old Testament, the Seventh-day Sabbath, the belief that the Messiah is coming. We all believe that he's coming. Lutherans, God's Word, salvation by grace, the Godhead. Methodists, the Godhead, salvation by grace, emphasis on holiness, celebrating the Lord's Supper. Nazarenes, the 
Bible is the word of God. Salvation through Christ, the Godhead, Jesus' second coming. Pentecostals, the Bible is the only rule of faith. Salvation through the blood of Christ, the gift of the Spirit, Jesus' second coming, baptism, virgin birth. Presbyterians, inspiration of the Bible, the Godhead, eternal life through Jesus Christ, second coming, virgin birth, Seventh-day Baptist, the Bible is the inspired word of God, salvation through Christ alone, the Godhead, second coming, baptism by immersion, Seventh-day Sabbath, Seventh-day Sabbath, the virgin birth, religious liberty. So where did I get all this? Well, there's this little book called Studying Together. I don't know if anybody has it or not. You can get it from the ABC. It's by Mark Finley. It has all our beliefs in it through Bible studies that we can use to give to other people. Uh, it has Christian living advice in there and it has lists of understanding what other believers uh, believe like us. When we talk with somebody, we want to build a bridge. And you don't build a bridge by talking about our differences. It's the things that we have in common. And let's remember that they all believe in Jesus. So they're all safe. So all these people are saved right there. Now this is interesting. Sorry about the poor quality here. I had a better one, but it was on my external hard drive and it fried itself. So. These two people up here, those people are married. He's a pastor at Battle Creek. And the child that Jesus was holding was their daughter. So when Nathan Green put this together, he put people in there that he knows. Let's see what my notes are here. Paul asked for prayer. He asked the Colossians to pray for him as he was also giving them instructions. Devote yourself to prayer with an alert mind and a thankful heart. Pray for us too that God will give us many opportunities to speak about his mysterious plan concerning Christ. That is why I am here in chains. So that's when Paul wrote this. Pray that I will proclaim this message as clearly as I should. And then addressing them, he said, live wisely among those who are not believers and making the most of every opportunity. Let your conversation be gracious and attentive, attractive, so that you will have the right response for everyone. <coughs> I'm sure we're all familiar with the uh, Great Commission in Matthew. This is something that struck me as I was putting this together. It says, therefore, go and make disciples among nations. When I first joined the church, they were saying, you don't have to go to Africa because nation starts at your front door. But sometimes it starts right across the dinner table. It says, baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Okay, we got that one. We've got pastors that do that. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you. And be sure of this. I am with you always, even to the end of the age. I read that, and I thought, teach. What about Bible study? Well, I found out that you can't teach without studying. 
If I was to go over everything that I studied and read to put this together, we'd be here all day. So, if you teach, you're going to be studying. <coughs> Not just studying. <coughs> now, if this is heavy on you, that's between you and God. But this was a call for me. But I'm not doing what I'm supposed to do. It's interesting. Pastor gave me this assignment a couple months ago. I started working on this. And it was supposed to be last week. But he had to be away this week, so I've got this week. I'm going to ask Ricky to read something out of our Sabbath School quarterly. It was in yesterday's lesson. You got a mic? But God will have a people upon the earth to maintain the Bible and the Bible only, as the standard of all doctrines and the basis of all reforms. The option, excuse me, the opinions of learned men, the deductions of science, the creeds of decisions of ecclesiastical councils, as numerous and discordant as the churches which they represent, the voice of the majority. Not one nor all of these should be regarded as evidence for, a, for or against any point of religious faith. Before accepting any doctrine or precept, we should demand a plain, thus saith the Lord, in its support. Thank you, Rachel. I found this in uh, uh, the Review and Herald notes. It says, a great work to be done by men now idle. It is not God's purpose that ministers should be left to do the greatest part of the work of sowing the seed of truth. Men who are not called to the gospel ministry are to be encouraged to label, labor for the master's accounting and to their several abilities. Master according. according to their yes. Hundreds of men and women I wondered if they were going to bring you cows into this. <laughs> Hundreds of men and women, now idle, could, be, could do acceptable service by carrying the truth into, homes, into the homes of their neighbors and friends. They could do a great work for the Master. God is no respecter of persons. He will use humble, devoted Christians who have the love of the truth in their heart. Let such ones engage in service for him by doing house-to-house -house work, setting by the fireside, or you could say the pool, depending on where you are. Such men, if humble, discreet, and godly, can such men, if humble, discreet, and godly, can do more to meet the real needs of families than could the minister. Review and Herald, August 26, 1902. So with this thing that's coming up that we're having, it does give us a chance to reach out to the people that we know, our friends and neighbors. Final hymn is 331.
It says, Lord, help us to have the same attitude as Jesus, who humbled himself and who humbled himself and became obedient to death. Thank you that you exalt him. Thank you that you exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name. That is the name of Jesus. Every knee shall bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord. Amen.